Hello, everyone. Um, so I, let's get started. Uh, so my name is Jana Bruda, and I'm the director of events here at HashiCorp. I want to welcome you all for joining today's webinar, uh, Eliminating Secret Sprawl Across Your Pri Private and Public Infrastructure Using HashiCorp by Vault. In addition to Seth Vargo, the Director of Technical Advocacy here at HashiCorp, we are also joined by Will Benston. Uh, he's a Senior Security Program Manager at NUNA. Thank you, uh, Will and Seth, and thank you. Thank you to all of you for listening to today's webinar. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we will make it available later today. Also, if time permits, we will allow for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as they come up. I will read and collect all the questions and group similar que questions together um, and I will pass them along to the presenters. Again, this is if time allows. We will do our best to follow up with any questions, and uh, if some questions don't get answered, we'll send them in an email after the webinar. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Yana. Uh, as Yana said, my name is Seth, and I am the Director of Technical Advocacy here at HashiCorp. Uh, I'm very excited to talk with all of you about Vault today. For those of you that uh, are not familiar, Vault is an open source tool designed to solve the management of secrets in any infrastructure on any platform with any architecture, regardless of whether it's a you know modern microservices oriented architecture, uh, you know legacy monolith, uh, those big Java applications, or anything in between. Um, and it's designed to scale to any size organization. So whether you're a tiny little one to two person startup or a massive enterprise. Uh, Vault is able to work for you. But before we get started on Vault, I wanted to ask a really generic question, really to just frame the conversation here. And that question is this, how many of you have a production credential on your laptop or machine right now as we watch this webinar? So I'll give you all a moment to think about that. And I'll follow up. If you can SSH into a production environment access any private company code from something like, you know, Atlassian Stash or GitHub or Bitbucket, or even just view metrics and log data, you have some type of production credential on your laptop right now. So that begs a follow-up question, which is what happens to that credential if you were to leave the company right now? So let's say right now you decide you would like to quit your job, a better opportunity comes along. Does anybody know you have those credentials? Does your manager or the IT team, do they know that those credentials exist on your local workstation? How do they go about revoking those credentials? Do they have to manually run some commands? Is it something like a single sign-on? Who is responsible for revoking those? Is there a playbook, a wiki article? What is the actual process and who is responsible for going through and making sure that credential is deleted? Moreover, is it even safe to revoke that credential? Maybe it's a shared credential. You're using you know, the same SSH key to log into all your production infrastructure, or you have a database password that is also used by some of the front end machines. So is it even safe to revoke this credential because it might be used by other users or machines or both? And finally, what is the dependency tree there? If I do revoke this credential, what is the cascading impact down the line? So obviously I'm revoking this SSH key, but is that being used elsewhere? Is it maybe connecting to GitHub or Bitbucket to clone code somewhere else? There's very poor visibility in most systems into how a credential is being used, why it's being used, and by whom or by what that credential is being used. It would be much better if there existed a centralized system that kept track of all of the credentials so that we could easily revoke them at any time. And this same concept of what happens if you, know, your, uh, you leave your job today applies to machines and applications as well. All too often, we require humans to intervene for a machine or an application to get a database credential or a password whenever um, applications themselves should be able to retrieve those credentials without uh, manual intervention. So let's say you have an application, that application is long running and it dies. What happens to those credentials from that previous application? Are they reused by a new version? 
are all of your instances of your applications using the same shared credential? And if so, how does that impact something like a security breach? So let's discuss what an ideal world would be that would implement the best modern security architectures for a hypothetical situation. First, we would have a, uh, let's say this is an application that needs to talk to a database. So maybe you know, a front-end application that has some back-end customer data. We would have a centralized database uh, that contained all of this customer information. And that database itself would be secured. You know, the database administrators would be responsible for securing that the same way um, that they do now. Applications in this scenario need the ability to read and write data, right? There's some front-end uh, GUI that needs both read and write permissions to this database. The database administrators themselves also need read and write and possibly admin. They need to be able to compress and run analytics and do reporting. Developers need read-only access to this database so that they can run queries and potentially see the data structures as they're building out this application. It's important that these credentials are never reused or shared. So if we have multiple instances of this particular application, each instance should receive its own credential. That way, in the event of a data breach, we can safely revoke one credential and we'll take down one instance of the production application, but all of the remaining instances will continue to function as planned. The same is true for humans. Each developer should have their own credential so that if a developer leaves the company, he or she, uh, has their credential revoked and it doesn't impact everyone else on the team. And furthermore, those credentials should not be shared. We shouldn't be using credentials that are generated for humans on the machines and the machines should not be given, machine credentials should not be given to humans so that they can interact with the system. Unlike traditional passwords where we, you know, we create a user and it's valid for a long time, these credentials should expire after a period of inactivity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But one of the um, core principles of Vault and one of the architecture decisions is that everything has a lifetime. It has a TTL. So unlike creating a password and shoving it in a, a plain text file and it lives forever, the credentials we generate with Vault actually have a lifetime. And this is important when we talk about uh, how secrets are revoked over time so that we don't prevent this massive distribution of secrets and credentials that aren't actually being used. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is minimum human involvement. Right now, if you think about a situation like this, traditionally, to get a database password into an application, a human needs to log into a system, run some commands, copy and paste some output, and then put it somewhere else so that the application can access it. You know, if you're a startup, um, most likely, you know, you SSH into a production machine and you copy and paste something you found from Stack Overflow and you have a new user and then you put that in your, your application's you know, configuration file and you walk away from it. If you're a larger enterprise or a more security conscious organization, you probably have database administrators. So you file a ticket, um, a database administrator does that same uh, process of creating a user and then sends it to you and you put it in the text file. Um, it's very rare for us to generate per application credentials and you may be storing those credentials in a secure manner, but they're likely shared across all of the instances. So in order to accomplish these and many more goals, we really needed to take a step back and generate a revolutionary approach to secrets management. So these are the areas in which Vault focuses. Uh, this is the problem space that Vault is designed to solve. First, Vault is designed to be a single source for all secrets and credentials. So Vault is both a static secret store. You can think of this as like encrypted Redis or encrypted memcached where you can put static data in. It is encrypted in transit and at rest. It is stored that way. And then when you retrieve it, you retrieve the encrypted value and you decrypt it. At the same time, Vault is a dynamic secret acquisition engine. It is able to generate dynamic secrets. And this was great for things like database passwords or cloud access keys. Let me give you a concrete example there and we'll have a demo of this later. Let's say I have a Postgres instance and I want to generate a username and password so my application could connect to that database. Instead of a human going in and logging into Postgres and running the create user command, Vault can do all of that for us and it's fronted by an HTTP API. So anyone who's authorized and authenticated can hit that HTTP API endpoint and generate a new credential. This allows for easy automation as well as integration at both the human and machine layers. 
The same thing applies for things like cloud access keys, AWS credentials, for example. So this is where Vault really separates itself from other secret management solutions in that it is not just a thing that encrypts data, and that's certainly one of the things it does, but it's also able to go out and generate credentials on the fly. And this is really important because it manages them in a centralized way. Along with that, since Vault is able to store and generate secrets, we need a way for machines to authenticate against Vault. So individual applications and machines need to be able to say, hey, I'm an application, I'm authorized to get information. And that authorization needs to be tied, that authentication needs to be tied to an authorization. On the machine side of things, we have the ability to authenticate via you know, certificates, via tokens, or via cloud metadata. Those machines need to be able to access information directly through the API. So most modern programming languages have the ability to communicate with an HTTP or HTTPS API. That's what Vault exposes. So if you have a language, an application that's written in a language like that, you have the ability to communicate with Vault. But on the flip side, we also need operator access or human access. And the authentication piece there is a bit different. For a machine to authenticate, it's totally fine to use something like a certificate or a token. But as a human, we're not going to manually type out you know, a, a PEM file. <laughs> that's a little bit too much typing. Um, so instead, we have different authentication mechanisms that are really catered towards humans. So things like GitHub, you can think of OAuth. Um, it's not OAuth, but it behaves like OAuth, where you can log in with GitHub, and that authorizes you and authenticates you within Vault. Same is true for just username and password. So we have different authentication mechanisms that cater to different audiences. Some are machine-based and some are operator-based. And operators also need access to the Vault but they probably don't want to interact directly with the API. Um, some people are really great with curl and, and JQ, but other people prefer things like a UI and a CLI. And Vault has that for the operator access component. So if you think about Vault's target audience uh, in terms of features, it's actually two different things. First is humans, operators, developers, uh, systems administrators, DevOps engineers. And the second audience is actually machines or applications, uh, non-humans, if you will. So when we take a look at those features, Vault also needed to meet parity requirements with existing security solutions. Specifically, we need to use state-of-the-art encryption algorithms. So there are lots of vulnerabilities and, and tools like OpenSSL that we've seen over the years. Uh, it's really important that we're using state-of-the-art encryption and we can upgrade that encryption and patch vulnerabilities as they become available. Protection from rogue operators. So no matter how strong our encryption is, uh, humans are always a weak point. We've seen this in a number of the social engineering attacks. So how can Vault protect against one person from having complete access in the system? Part of that comes coupled with a system of checks and balances. Because Vault has a dynamic secret acquisition engine, we really need integration with many different providers, different databases, different key value stores, so that we can go out and interact with these tools because everyone's infrastructure is different. They're using different technologies and different solutions, and Vault should really be able to integrate with as many of them as possible. In order to support most of the requirements of any organization, we need a verbose authorization policy and ACL system. For larger organizations, we need to be able to run at high availability and high scale. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is trust in the market. And this is something that's really challenging to address is how do you build trust in a market where the consumer is inherently untrustful? So how have we met those requirements? Well, Vault uses AES 256-bit encryption all across the board. We use something called Shamir secret sharing algorithm, which I'll discuss more in detail in a bit, that protects one person from having complete access in the system. It prevents a rogue operator or a rogue Vault administrator from accessing all the data or uh, leaking all of the data. Our system of checks and balances is, is um, countered by a verbose audit logging and ACL system. So almost every request and response in Vault is written to the audit log. So there is a system of checks and balances. You can send that audit log to any type of anomaly detection system, um, and you can review those logs at any time. There are 30, uh, over 30 backends and um, various custom plugins that you can write and build Vault from source to integrate with. So things from ranging from you know, Postgres and Cassandra and MySQL, Microsoft SQL, AWS, um, down to storage backends, such as storing data on the file system or console. 
Um, for the ACLs and authorization policies, Vault has a state-of-the-art policy system with many sources of authentication. Again, we talked about you know, the different TLS and username and password and GitHub authentications, and there are many more. Vault comes with built-in support for high availability depending on your storage backend. So if your storage backend supports high availability, you're able to run Vault in high availability mode. And we have uh, a number of users and a number of customers who are running Vault at uh, incredibly massive scale. I can't talk about the exact numbers, but um, they're quite astonishing, the number of requests that they're putting through Vault. Um, so it runs at an incredible scale. Uh, it's written in Go, like most of our tools, um, so we're able to achieve a lot of performance improvements from that. And then for trust in the market, it's really difficult to show this, um, partially because a lot of Vault's users don't like to talk about the fact that they're using Vault. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by uh, one of our users, uh, one of our customers who was able to talk about it. But part of the security threat model is, is not even sharing what security tools you're using. Um, so we have a number of customers, but we've also coupled that with multiple independent security audits by um, different auditing firms who have identified you know, medium and low level risk things that have all been fixed and patched. Uh, and the latest versions of Vault have all passed with flying colors. Um, so we have that trust in the market with those independent security audits that um, routinely happen throughout Vault's code base. So I want to take a moment to discuss the Shamir secret sharing algorithm, um, both because it's a complex topic, but also because it's one of my favorite components of Vault. Again, the Shamir secret sharing algorithm is the piece that's designed for protection from rogue operators to prevent one person from having complete access in the system. And it looks a little bit like this. <clears throat> Shamir secret sharing algorithm is a mechanism by which we take a key or a string, if you will, and we break that string apart into a number of sub pieces or sub keys, such that a subset of those keys can come together to recreate that key. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say I have a string A, B, C, D. If I could somehow break that apart into five pieces, such that I could apply a transformation function to three of those pieces and regenerate A, B, C, D, then I have Shamir secret sharing algorithm. And it's challenging to think about this in terms of you know, physical strings. Um, but actually, the algorithm is, is real. It's on Wikipedia. You can check it out yourself. Um, but it's designed to split a key into a number of shards that are configurable and then distribute those shards securely to various people in the organization. So how does this solve that rogue operator problem? When a vault is first initialized, vault generates an encryption key. That encryption key is what is used to encrypt all of the data at rest on the system. So if you're using the file system storage backend, that encryption key is what's going to encrypt that data as it's stored on disk. That encryption key itself is encrypted in vault. It's stored in its own encrypted backend, but it's encrypted with something that's called the master key. And that master key only ever exists in memory <clears throat> during Vault's initialization process. Once that key is created, it's immediately split apart into a configurable number of shares, and those shares are distributed to various people in the organization. When we bring up a new Vault instance or whenever we unseal the Vault, a subset of those users, again, which is completely configurable, have to each enter their key in order to regenerate the master key to decrypt the encryption key so that the data can flow through Vault. If you've ever seen a bank unlock a vault, a big physical vault, oftentimes the bank manager as well as an employee both need to insert a key and turn them at the same time in order to un unlock the vault. The Shamir secret sharing algorithm works the same way, but it's much more uh, cryptographic and mathematical instead of physical. The order of the keys and who enters them doesn't matter as long as we meet the threshold requirements. Now, Vault's architecture is one such that Vault can't operate without that master key. It's not like a simple Boolean, like, you know, if Vault equals equals unsealed, continue. Um, the barrier is actually the cryptographic seal around the Vault. It's directly tied to that master key and the encryption key, such that data can't flow through the Vault unless it is unsealed. So if we have a rogue operator, you know, someone who's leaving the company on non-graceful terms, <laughs> Um, it's possible to, um, sorry, I'm just going to mute. Um, it's possible to uh, prevent 
that particular operator from going rogue and accessing the data in the system. When we seal the vault, a threshold of key holders would need to come together to um, interact with that particular uh, vault again. It would need to each enter their unseal key. And if that operator was going rogue, we wouldn't have a threshold of unsealed keys. So he or she would not be able to access the data in vault or delete the data in, in the vault server. Um, here we have vault architecture. Uh, on the left hand side there, kind of surrounding the whole middle, you can see the barrier. Again, that's directly tied to the cryptographic seal. Um, <clears throat> there's a clear separation of components between what is inside and what is outside of the security barrier. Only the storage backend and the HTTP API are outside. All of the other components are inside of the barrier. The storage backend itself is untrusted and it's used to durably store encrypted data. When the vault server is started, it must be provided a storage backend so that that data is available across a restart of the system or across high availability mode. The API also needs to be uh, running so that the vault server uh, can be accessed by external clients. Again, any and all requests through vault happen through the API. Even if you're using the vault CLI, you still are actually going through the HTTP API. Vault is just a very thin wrapper around an HTTP API client. And by having this API, any application capable of making a web request can easily request and renew credentials from Vault. So in summary, Vault provides a single source for secrets, thus eliminating secret sprawl. If every application and every human who needs a credential goes through Vault, Vault has a single source for all of those secrets. It exposes secrets as a service through an HTTP API uh, and that API can also be over SSL, it can be fronted with TLS, <clears throat> but we just say HTTP API for simplicity. It aids in the uh, dynamic creation of credentials, and it supports many different authentication mechanisms for both humans and machines. It protects against external threats using state-of-the-art encryption, and it protects against internal threats with the uh, verbose ACLs and Shamir secret sharing algorithm. It's designed to support hundreds of thousands of machines and operators, and probably most importantly, it's designed such that secrets don't live forever. And we'll see more of that in the demo. But now I'd like to hand it over to Will from Nuna Health. As I'm sure you're aware, our healthcare is one of the most tightly regulated industries around the world. Uh, today we're really privileged to hear from one of Vault's early adopters on how Vault aided credential management for their healthcare centric business. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Will from Nuna Health, and then we'll jump back for a live demo, so be sure to stick around to the end. Will? Great, thanks Seth. So as uh, Yana mentioned, I work for a company called Nuna, uh, but who are we? We are a healthcare data analytics company tackling one of the United States of America's biggest problems. Um, what does quality in healthcare actually mean? And what should the true price of healthcare actually be? We do this by gathering, learning, and improving with our customers. Uh, we gather, standardize, and structure our health and wellness data in a secure cloud-based home. We understand your population, partner with our team of data scientists and researchers to ask the questions and understand the answers. We help you understand what's working, we get rid of what doesn't, and we make changes that benefits everyone. So we do this with a team of data scientists with specialties in biomed biomedical informatics, health economics, and epidemiology. Our data science take on the challenges, especially when they can combine their expertise and help you ask the, and answer the big questions that you're looking for. Being that Nuna sits in the healthcare space, <clears throat> and we're trying to take on one of the largest data sets in the US, Medicaid with more than 73 million lives, security sits at our foundation. It's truly a part of our culture and our products. We use modern tools, engineering techniques, and processes in the security business to keep your information safe. So what challenges are we actually facing? Due to the industry we operate in, we face many, many challenges in compliance. We must be HIPAA compliant. We have to adhere to the acceptable risk safeguards. We're pursuing SOC 2 in order to meet other potential contracts on the horizon. And to top it off, we have internal privacy policies that encapsulate the above and more. So through this, we're using a 
vault by HashiCorp in order to help us accomplish this. So let's take a look at where we actually started and move into where we are today and how Vault has, ex has enabled us to do this. When we first started out, we had overly permissive AWS IAM rules. We had static secrets only, so once we wrote a secret, we had the secret, never was changing. We used KMS for storage. We actually ended up writing our own tool around KMS in order to enable our users to utilize KMS for secret storage. The problem we had was everyone had access. Everyone had access to every KMS key, so everyone had access to every secret. It was truly a hard problem to solve. We had database passwords and accounts that were controlled by the users. Users were actually cloud forming their databases themselves and setting the default passwords. When we took a step back and analyzed what these passwords were, we noticed that they were all weak. Um, our users weren't educated in actually creating cryptographically secure passwords. Um, and once again, everyone had access to everything. So we also had individuals having access to root, which we flagged as a big problem as well. We found that we had walled card certificates deployed internally uh, to make SSL and TLS communications easier, and we decided that we wanted to fix that as well. Uh, and most importantly, we had instances with debug keys owned by particular users. So as Seth mentioned, what happens when a user goes away? Uh, due to the fact that individuals were launching instances in AWS themselves, they would attach their debug key which gave them access to those systems at all times. So it made it really, really hard to try to limit the amount of access a user had and whether or not they could access production assets, uh, development assets, or you know test assets because they were actually deploying systems with their key. And so Vault helped us tackle uh, these problems. So these are just a snapshot of the items we found, uh, but starting our journey to compliance. So let's see how we actually went about doing this. We decided to take a step back and be secure from the beginning, and Vault helped us do this and became our key tool for us, sitting internally and having all systems operate off of Vault. So we operate 100% in AWS, and we have Vault deployed as a high availability system with three Vault servers, three console servers, all being backed behind an ELB. So if we take a look at this a little bit more, we have three Vault servers um, that are set up at the same time. And if you're familiar with how high availability in Vault works, you know that you only have one Vault active at once with the remaining nodes in your server cluster uh, in standby. We decided to go with MySQL as our backend for storage due to the fact that we want, really wanted to have a stateless uh, system. One of our key pieces as we start deploying systems within Nuna is can it be stateless or do we have to juggle how we actually keep state from instance to instance as we continue to deploy and roll systems. So MySQL was the avenue that we decided. Uh, we went through lots of hardships when we first deployed this system in that we had a single vault instance with a MySQL back. Uh, we decided that this wasn't very good in if Vault were ever to seal, we'd cripple our systems. Um, and so we decided to go about the high availability route, and we hit another hiccup in that we deployed three Vault servers with MySQL backend, but never actually deployed console to depict the HA availability. This doesn't work very well. Um, so what we have now is we have a cluster of three Vault servers with uh, a cluster of MySQL backends that are high availability, and then console in a cluster that's dedicated to Vault itself in order to depict which Vault is actually active or not. Uh, we utilize Vault's HTTP response codes uh, to feed our health signal in our ELB so that only the active Vault is being hit by the requests from all of our instances. Should that Vault seal, we have instant rollover to one of the standby Vaults, <clears throat> and then we can keep proceeding and keep our systems up. Seth mentioned that there are many different authentication plugins that you can actually enable, we decided to use LDAP as our authentication piece. As you see here, we have a VPC peering into another AWS account and another VPC to our centralized identity management system. Through here, we have numerous security groups that dictate which access to Vault you actually get 
and within Vault, what secrets you can actually access. And so as you authenticate to Vault, it reaches back into our identity management system to determine which policies and ACLs it should actually apply to you in that particular authentication instance. So this didn't come together <clears throat> overnight, but we've, we've moved a real long way and uh, we've been really happy with how we've been able to do things. So where do we stand with Vault? We use Vault for secret storage, and this is using the generic secret backend. We store things like API tokens, third-party service account passwords, field-level encryption passwords. Our, when we, I mentioned databases earlier. When we actually cloudform databases, that root password is stored securely in Vault so that we can then put that root password in a database back in. Uh, we're managing MySQL and Postgres databases for dynamic secret access. Uh, so we, we actually take that root password that's stored in a generic secret backend. We configure our database password, uh, MySQL and Postgres backends, to hand out <clears throat> dynamic user username and passwords to our users and services that need access. One of the real key benefits here from a compliance standpoint is that we have to guarantee that all of our users connect securely to our databases. Because all of our users and services are getting database passwords from Vault, we actually can control the, the grant statements within those mounts on Vault. So we can guarantee that we use require SSL on a MySQL grant statement, for example. So when an auditor comes in, we can show them that when a database user or a, a user at NUNA needs to get a password to a database, that username and password that's returned to them has the proper access levels and requires a secure connection to the database. So this helps us guarantee that connection and meet that part of the compliance. We use SSH backend as well. Um, this is mainly being used as our debug key management by Vault. I mentioned earlier that all of our users were deploying with their own debug keys. Um, so now we're able to actually deploy our auto-scaling groups with a debug key managed by Vault. Now we have other means for our users to SSH into our systems, but should those means fail us through our identity management backend, we can actually get a debug key from Vault. And Vault will enable us to get a local presence on that machine so that we can actually debug it. Hopefully we never need to use it, but it's there in case we have to. <clears throat> I mentioned wildcard certificates. So what we've actually done is uh, implemented the PKI backend as well. And we've actually implemented three mounts of that PKI backend. We have a prod, dev, and test mount. <clears throat> so what this has enabled us to do is separate our prod, dev, and test environments completely, not just from a VPC or security group level, but also at the TLS level. So if you're a prod server and you need a certificate for your front end or you know service, you actually get a prod certificate from our prod CA. Um, then we install that public chain uh, on our system, and then you can systems and services can talk to each other correctly. If you're a dev system, you do the same thing, but off the dev mount. Uh, but this, what this enables us to do is if a dev instance tried to talk to a prod instance, and we had a jumble in security groups that allowed that to happen by accident, uh, that connection wouldn't actually complete because of the different CAs, certificate authorities, actually issuing those certificates. So the dev instance won't trust the prod certificate authority and vice versa. I mentioned authentication. We use the LDAP backend uh, with Duo for our authentication for our users. Um, different accounts will lead to different access levels. Um, but everything is backed by the Duo authentication, which makes it really nice uh, for us. And then uh, since we're 100% in AWS, we've taken advantage of the AWS EC2 instance uh, authentication as well. And we've put code in place that all of our instances as they boot are automatically bootstrapped and authenticated to Vault based on their IAM roles. <clears throat> We're also utilizing the AWS mounts to manage our IAM for multiple users and projects. Uh, one of the nice things here is you can mount multiple AWS backends and control AWS credentials across multiple accounts. Um, this eliminates the need for federation 
and cross roles within AWS, and it makes it really, really nice. Um, and we also have per project policies that are enabling us to utilize our central identity management systems to determine what access levels within AWS and Vault you actually get. So if I'm on a certain project, I might have the base engineering access to S3 buckets, and I might get an additional one or two depending on the project. I might be on infrastructure engineering and actually have the permission to deploy systems so the AWS keys that I get back have those permissions on them. And most importantly, we have the audit backend enabled. Um, and not only do we have it enabled, but we actually are using those logs to detect what secrets people are um, accessing, and most importantly, what secrets users are trying to access that they don't have permission to. This has actually really enabled us to determine our user workflow with Vault and how they're actually using it. We noticed at one point that one of our employees was actually checking out 12 AWS credentials a day for the same role. And when we went in to investigate, we noticed that one of the scripts that they had written didn't necessarily take into consideration that they might already have credentials that are valid, and they might already have a, a Vault client token that is valid. So it, the script was just re-authenticating them each time, which en enabled uh, multiple account access through AWS. Um, one of the things I mentioned, or I should have mentioned when I was going over a Vault ar architecture, is due to the fact of the high availability -ness of Vault and the way that we've deployed it is we can actually do blue-green deployments and deploy a, an entirely new cluster of Vault that joins the same Vault cluster. So if we were to have our initial three Vault servers running and we want to roll those on a monthly basis in order to get um, our Linux patches and everything or potentially upgrade Vault as new versions continue to roll out, we could actually spin up another <clears throat> three vault servers, unseal those, then we can go through the process of resealing the other three vault uh, that are currently running, and this will kick all those standby nodes off, and then our new cluster is actually uh, becoming active, and we can use those, and then we can delete the existing vault servers. So the high availability mode allows you to do patch management and run an immutable infrastructure uh, without losing access to Vault. So it didn't come over together overnight. What did we do? How did we learn from it? I mentioned some of the MySQL stuff that we, you know, had assumed and kind of bit us over the end, but how can you get started and not make the same mistakes that we did? So some best practices. Turn on the audit back in, and most importantly, please do not log raw. What we found when analyzing the logs is when you actually log raw, you're logging everything raw in plain text to your disk. So if you have some sort of centralized logging infrastructure like Splunk, um, usernames and passwords are actually going to be logged to that as well. So be aware what you're actually turning on when you're auditing the back, when you're looking at your audit back in logs. And most importantly, uh, excuse me, investigate and look at those logs. It doesn't make much sense to actually turn on your audit back end log without actually looking into them. Have a development environment ready. Um, it's very important, especially as you're moving from one version of Vault to the next, to make sure that you understand the changes and have an environment that's safe to make those in. If you're wanting to know what a new, or investigating a new back end within Vault, you might also want to play with that in your development environment. And one of the things that I do is I actually have a local environment, which allows me to play within Vagrant or locally on my Mac system with a Vault system, with a Vault server myself. And on the next screen, I'll actually show an example of a simple Vault configuration file, which would enable you to have a local development environment on your system. Um, Vault has a nice dev environment, which runs in memory, but it's nice to have one that's local, saved to a file, so that you don't have to reconfigure it every time that you spin it up. Keep up to date with the latest versions, if it makes sense for you. 
read through the change log and make sure that what has changed isn't going to break anything that you currently have. Uh, depending on how you have your LDAP structure, I think it was moving from version 6.0 to 6.1, there were some breaking changes depending on how you might have had LDAP set up. And so it was important that we took note of the breaking changes and tested in a development environment before. And most importantly, make sure you look for security updates. HashiCorp is very good at making sure that their products are secure, and if any security uh, vulnerability is found, that they patch those immediately. And like Seth said, they have external people audit their, actually, their code in order to make sure that they're delivering a strong product to you. Um, so if you need an update for security patches, I recommend doing that. Their change log is available on their GitHub Vault project. Um, one thing I recommend also is joining the Google group. It's been a great resource when I don't know something. And uh, <clears throat> the Vault main engineer, Jeff Mitchell, is very, very active and gets back to you really quickly. I've been impressed with how many responses I see from him a day and how quickly he's been able to do so. Uh, if you aren't a member already, I suggest that you go to join the Google group Vault-Tool. Uh, one of the most important things and what we didn't really understand correctly off the bat was what does TTL and Max TTL actually mean for your team? Uh, there's a default TTL and Max TTL when you spin up Vault yourself. Uh, this has changed over time as well, so that's something to note. But you can configure that in your Vault configuration file to set a TTL and Max TTL that makes sense for your company. And most importantly, what happens if you don't renew within that TTL period? One thing that we <clears throat> didn't really understand uh, off the bat was that we actually had to do a Vault token renew or our dynamic credentials would go away. So we had some services that were running and they didn't have a job that, or a you know, binary that was managing their token for them. And we found that their database credentials were getting revoked. And when looking into that, we noticed that, okay, the client token wasn't being renewed. That's our problem. But what makes sense for us in this service? How often should they renew? Uh, what should our max be? Uh, you know, those are the things that you should understand and play with to get to determine what's right for your industry and most importantly, your company. Uh, one of the nice things that Vault has actually allowed us to do is when you create a dyna dynamic secret, you get a revoke path which allows you on a, as a security engineer or from a, you know, an infrastructure engineering team, if you accidentally grant a, to, a dynamic secret or you know, a, <clears throat> a user has checked out AWS credentials from Vault and then they've notified you that over lunch their laptop was stolen from their car, but you know that your TTL was 12 hours for the AWS credential. You can actually go in and issue a Vault revoke on that path and delete those dynamic secrets. So what this actually allowed us to do as well is test out connections to databases on products that we do not own and host internally. And this allowed us to understand what products are actually having a consistent or persistent connection to databases. We'd, we'd issue a, a vault database password uh, for MySQL to uh, a product and then we would revoke it and notice that the product was still working. So if the product does that, you know, it doesn't make, it, it alleviates what the benefit of the dynamic secret is. So you have to understand your environment, understand the MySQL and put protections in place beyond what Vault can do for you as well. Vault takes you all the way there, but sometimes it doesn't get you all the way due to the fact that other software are doing things not, in a not ideal way. So most importantly, make it easy for engineering to take advantage. Uh, this reduces friction as you roll out the new secrets management if you're just rolling Vault out. Make sure that your users can understand how to use it. Uh, Vault Enterprise has a lovely UI that makes it really easy to explore secrets, write secrets, uh, write policies, things like that. Not all users are <clears throat> CLI friendly, and if you're getting into Vault for the first time, uh, you might forget where paths are, you know, how do I write a secret, how do I read, how do I read just a certain field 
or a certain key value pair from a path. Um, so creating some secrets or some scripts in order to enable your users to do things easier um, is recommended. And one thing that we've done in order to bootstrap our AWS instances easier is we've created certain init scripts that, that get run automatically on our instances. And these handle things like vault authentication for our services. And so as engineering is rolling out a new service, they know by calling this one script, they'll get the credentials and everything that they need. Understand ACLs. This is very important when you're trying to protect secrets. But most importantly, have a plan for how you're actually going to write secrets in order to make your ACLs easier. Uh, we made this mistake when we first started is we just started writing secrets. We didn't really have a pattern. Uh, we just started writing secrets. We, you know, it'd be, you know, vault slash uh, service name slash secret slash value. Uh, and we just kind of went that way. And then we, what we quickly noticed is our, our policies were having to change frequently. Uh, so we went off and tr tried to restructure, and we wrote production secrets a certain way, development secrets a certain way, test secrets a certain way, so that if you're in certain groups within our identity management system, you'll actually get access correctly. It made writing our policies a lot easier, and it, we found that we didn't have to go back and edit our policies as frequently. So speaking of policies, we recommend controlling who or what can write policies. With any sort of <clears throat> secrets management infrastructure and moving away from the everyone has access to everything that I mentioned at the beginning, um, we needed to make sure that only proper individuals with understanding of vault policies and trust, being trusted could write the policies. Uh, and we took that one step further and moved to a system that allows us to write policies without actually logging into vault um, as a user. So we actually went uh, a route where you store a, a policy in Git, and once that has been reviewed by security and other folks that are the service owners, um, that gets merged into our repo, and upon merge, we have a continuous integration job that writes that policy for us. And it's nice that that uh, continuous integration job has a Vault ACL assigned to it such that it can write policies, but no other system in our environment can. It's important to control who can write policies because if you have a malicious insider, they can actually write a root policy and give their service access to everything. So on top of that, control who or what can authorize AWS EC2 roles. We've gone the route where every service that we have has a unique role. And not only the service itself, but the tier that that service lives in has a unique role. Uh, so it becomes a bottleneck from a security team when we can all, we are the only ones in, who are capable or have the ACL to write AWS EC2 roles and enable services to come online. So we've gone the same route and uh, using a repository and some tooling that we wrote in order to authorize AWS EC2 roles for our users almost as a self-service uh, function. Uh, and use Vault more, for more than just static secrets if you're able. I've seen numerous talks on Vault and uh, other users and how they're using it, and I've noticed one thing that they're, they're using it just to store static, static secrets. It's much more powerful than that, and it can really strengthen your organization if you decide to truly take advantage of the features that Seth went over earlier. And most importantly, configuration is code. Uh, one of the things we found when we first started investigating into Vault is how do we determine the configuration? Uh, and that's why we went about writing these tooling around what can write policies to Vault, and who or what can authorize AWS EC2 roles. We found it, that it's in our infrastructure, along with our instances that we build using Packer, it's nice to be able to see what is actually being installed, or in the Vault sense, what is actually being configured without having to manually log into Vault and go exploring and seeing what AWS EC2 roles are actually enabled. Of course, you should do this anyway um, in some sort of frequent audit, you know, perhaps quarterly to make sure that the roles that are still enabled aren't stale, um, make sure that someone didn't by accident go do something manually um, and get around policies. Um, but see, these are some of the things that have really helped us gain control and achieve 
<clears throat> uh, and achieve and make steps towards the compliance uh, standards that we have to meet. As I mentioned, uh, I would show an example of how you could actually a uh, vault configuration file that you could use to do local development. Uh, and this is what I use. I use the file backend. It writes things encrypted to my file system, and I have it listen on the default port of 8200. I disable uh, TLS, and most importantly, I disable MLock because I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, this isn't a high availability system, but I definitely don't want it to run as root on my local machine. Um, and so by disabling MLock, I don't have to give Vault the higher privileges that you might think. So where are we now and what's next? Uh, we have some key ac uh, outcomes. Our access to data is determined by membership within our centralized identity management system. Users no longer have static AWS keys. Um, or users are moving away from static uh, AWS keys, I should say. To date, we've had over 2,000 plus dynamic AWS keys within our engineering department, which is kind of amazing. When we took a look back at our key management within AWS before, we found that once a user got a static key, um, you know, be it that it had MFA applied to it, we found these keys were never rotated. Um, so people that had been at the company for two years had had the existing AWS keys assigned to them. Their access and secret keys never change. Uh, it enabled us to have cross AWS account access um, and enable users to have that easier. Uh, we don't just have one AWS account at Nuna. And so this allows us to mount multiple AWS backends within Vault to provide people access and most importantly, a centralized place to get that access. No longer are they having to assume roles. Uh, when we decide to create a new AWS account, we don't have to create federated roles across accounts in order to enable access. And it's allowed our users the ability to access other accounts and do their work easier. The AWS EC2 authentication has been key to enable our services to gain access to the secrets that they need in order to bootstrap our instances and kick those services on. KMS is only used with native resources now. Native resources being S3 server-side encryption, volume encryption, etc., um, RDS encryption. There is one caveat to this in that we actually use the original tool that we wrote around KMS to store our vault and console encryption secrets uh, and the root database password of our vault backend um, due to the fact that vault's not running. So how can we access those uh, keys if vault's not running? So what's next for us? Now we're going to continue to build out our tools to make adopting vault easier. Now I mentioned two things that we're doing, but there's other things that we want to do. Um, so we're exploring those options as well. And one thing that we're trying to do is investigate the transit backend a little more, gain a little more understanding of how it can enable us to further protect the data that we hold and make things easier for our developers. You know, having a tool like Vault that has encryption as a service through the transit backend is something that's really powerful and could strengthen the tools that we're writing. And so enough theory, let's uh, pass it back to Seth and have him walk you through some demos. Awesome, thanks, Will. Uh, uh, cool, can everyone see my screen? Cool, I see no objections, so I'm gonna go ahead and go for it. Um, what I have here is a Vault cluster that I have uh, provisioned in advance. Um, so I'll make this available afterwards, but what I wanna show you is just some of the basic operations for interacting with a Vault cluster. And I wanna start with reading and writing, updating and deleting, just static secrets. And I'm gonna preface this by saying it's not gonna feel very secure. Um, and that's because we've done a lot of work on Vault to make this feel and have a really good UX to feel as great as it possibly can. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write some data. And this is a Vault server that's running uh, out on the cloud somewhere. It's on Amazon if, if you want some specifics. So I've written some data into the generic secret backend and I can read that data back out. Um, everything in Vault is path-based, <clears throat> so secret slash foo is a path, just like a URL path, 
And you can see that I get the value that I've inserted in a refresh interval. We'll talk more about refresh intervals and leases in a second. I can also update existing values. So if I were to write to that same path with a new value, and these are just a series of arbitrary key value pairs, I can go ahead and write that. And when I read that value back, I'll get both author and value. It's also possible to list. So I can list everything under a secret, and you'll see I get two keys, uh, foo and webinar. So static secrets and vault solve the majority of the problems, but it doesn't give us the ability to do like per node or per machine secrets. Um, those credentials there actually have an infinite lifetime. They have a hint of a refresh, but they do live forever. Uh, and there's a requirement that an operator actually goes and inserts them. I have to type vault write, you know, secret foo with the value in there, which means a human knows a password, uh, which increases the surface area for attack there. Vault can also act as like the root or super user for many databases and external services to dynamically generate sub-accounts based on a configured policy or role. So let's take a moment to look at AWS. Let's say you're a developer and you need access to communicate with AWS APIs for your application or to run a console command locally. Normally, someone with more privileged access has to log into the AWS console, click a bunch of times, create your credential with the proper remissions, and then somehow securely distribute those access keys to you. Maybe they PGP encrypt it and send it in an email, or they you know, DM it over Slack. <clears throat> this is troublesome because it requires uh, two people to take time out of their day to do this, and also the original person who created that credential has access to it. So we don't have true provenance. We can't guarantee that when that credential is used, that it was used by the owner. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. With Vault, we can automate the policies and configuration automatically. We give Vault a privileged set of AWS account permissions and the instructions, the IAM policy and role, and then Vault will automatically generate credentials for us. So developers authenticate to Vault using you know, GitHub or username and password. That's mapped to an authorization. If they're authorized, they can programmatically generate AWS credentials that are tied to a pre-configured IAM policy without human intervention. So let me show you what that looks like. I should be able to read um, AWS creds developer. And here you can see I got an access key and a secret key back. And um, they're valid for 30 seconds, so they have a very short lifetime. But this is an actual AWS secret key and um, access key that could be used to query the API. <clears throat> so based on this process and now that it's codified, there's very little room for human error. Additionally, this path can be tightly restricted with ACLs, and those ACLs can be mapped to policies. For example, you can say anyone in the engineers team of the HashiCorp GitHub organization can generate AWS keys, or anyone in the OU devs in the company LDAP server can generate credentials. And we can generate multiple credential backends. I could have a credential backend for um, you know, application that has slightly less privilege, and those are all tied to customizable IAM roles. So acquiring AWS credentials is mostly a human-based operation, but we can take a look at something that's more machine-based, such as generating Postgres credentials. So I'll go ahead and do that now. <clears throat> you can see it's the same process. We read from PostgreSQL, creds read only. This is going to actually uh, have Vault connect to a Postgres server that I've configured ahead of time. Vault makes a connection to Postgres, runs configurable SQL to create a user and grant that user permissions that I have to find ahead of time, and then returns a username and password. So this username here and this password here are actual credentials that you could use to log into this Postgres instance. Each time we read from this path, we'll get a new username and password. Vault connects to the server, does that whole um, process. These credentials are valid for two minutes. After two minutes, if they're not renewed, they expire. That means if our application goes down for some reason, or if it's restarted and it gets a new credential, our surface area for attack here is two minutes. After two minutes, these credentials will no longer be valid. But if the application is still using these credentials, it can renew them uh, using uh, the renewal process, which unfortunately we don't have time to get in here today, but it's documented on Vault's website. All of these CLI commands that I'm running here are actually just a mask around the API. Almost all interactions take place via the API. So here is a curl command that does the exact same thing that I did earlier, which is reading from PostgreSQL creds read only, but instead of using the Vault CLI, it's using curl, which is a uh, popular tool for making HTTP requests on the command line. 
And you can see here I get a JSON response and there's some additional data in this JSON response that wasn't originally contained in the Vault CLI. We get some additional metadata. But you can see there's a username and a password directly in this payload. So if your application can make an HTTP request and parse JSON, you can interact with Vault. It's a pretty low barrier to entry. Um, pretty much every modern programming language has the ability to do this. If it's not built into the core library, there's some plugin or external library that can handle it for you. Uh, and this includes things like Chef and Puppet, Ansible, Salt, these configuration management tools. They have the ability to communicate with Vault because it's really just an HTTP or HTTPS request away. So we're running short on time. Um, I find demos aren't exciting unless you're involved too. So up until this point, I've doing, been doing everything as um, you know, the user and you're sitting here listening and we're reaching the end of an hour and you're probably bored. So I figure it's time for you to interact with this. So I've actually gone ahead and set up a public vault instance. So if you head over to vault.hashicorp.rocks forward slash app, you'll be taken to a page like this. So that's uh, vault.hashicorp.rocks forward slash app. Let's see if I can do this. There, vault.hashicorp.rocks forward slash app. And from there, uh, you can get more information about Vault and Vault Enterprise, which Will was talking about, that uh, the open source tooling and then the UI on top of it. But you can also click this Get Vault Token button. And this is a real Vault token. This um, this is a little JavaScript thing that I wrote that is actually querying a Vault server. It is generating a token, and this token has the ability to read from a particular path, and it has five uses. After five uses, it'll automatically expire, and it's valid for a very short period of time. I give you a curl command that you can use. So here's a, a curl command. I'm just going to copy that, and we'll jump back on my local laptop here. So this is my local workstation. I'll go ahead and paste that. And you can see I get a response back. This is querying a public Vault instance at vault.hashicorp.rocks over TLS. Um, and I'm getting back the uh, secret message, which is uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. So I'll leave this up for a little bit. You're all welcome to play around with it. Um, just a very basic uh, interactive thing. If you're interested in learning more about Vault or working with Vault, on Vault's website, we do have an interactive demo. Uh, if you launch the interactive tutorial right on vaultproject.io, it'll take you through a number of uh, different steps and configurations for Vault. And the Vault website is also the easiest place to get started with all of the documentation, uh, community resources, and uh, downloads. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Jana to close out the webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Seth, and thank you, Will. Um, so we're so grateful that you are you were all able to join. Uh, as we said in the beginning, the webinar was recorded, and we will make the recording available probably in a couple of hours. You know, since we did run out of time for questions, we'll answer the questions offline, and then we'll send everyone an email uh, with the answers. So thank you so much for joining, and have a great day.